dear fathers, sisters, dear faithful, the title of this conference is Mary, Mother, well, Spouse and Mother. Let's first start with the view of God on the family. Obviously, in the plan of God, the Creator, God wanted man to start his life, and not only to start, but to have all his life develop in the family. First, he comes in the family, and then he's supposed to build up a new family, and so on. What do we want to say with this? We want to say that the family, by God's disposition, is the most fundamental institution for human mankind. God has made man in such a way that he starts his life within, within a family. And then it's there that he will be built, be reformed, will receive the education. But God not only wanted this society, institution, which is perfectly corresponding to the needs of the human nature, God wanted to go much, much further. And this corresponding to the end he has given to this human creature. Why does God create man? What is his, his, his reason, his intention? Well, whenever God gives the existence to a human being, it is because he wants to make out of this creature a child of God. And for eternity, he wants to share with this creature his own infinite, eternal, happiness. That's the reason why God gives the existence, creates out of nothing any human beings here on earth. And with this perspective, God wanted to elevate the family starting from the ground of the family, which is the marriage, the bond of marriage, elevating the bond of marriage at the level of a sacrament. What do we mean when we say a sacrament? Sacrament is or has, if you want, two elements. One which is at our level and one which is at the level of God. The element which is at the level of God is too far away from any of our capacities of grasping, of knowing, of experimenting. It is strictly at the level of God himself and it is the grace the grace which we call sanctifying grace because it is the grace that makes saint it is a formal participation to divine nature and divine life so this element which is at the level of God by God's mercy, 
he wanted to link to something which is at our level. And that's what we call a sacrament. The element which is at our level will be something falling under our senses which will be a, a sign, which will express something of this grace which we receive in any sacrament. That's the definition of a sacrament, a sensitive sign which is producing invisibly in our soul what it means. So we have in the sacrament of marriage something very, very special. In fact, every sacrament is, is, has something in common, the way we call it sacrament, and something which is distinguishing one from the other. The sacrament of marriage has two ministers. In all the others, you have only one, and I may say usually it's the priest, sometimes the bishop, for baptism can be anybody, even a pagan. But for marriage, you need two. The ministers, that is those who are going to perform the sacrament, will be the future husband and wife. It is something very, very special. And what God is doing, in fact, it is elevating the contract of marriage, because the marriage is a contract. Both give to the other the right on their body. That is the strict, let's say, contract of marriage. And God is going to elevate precisely this bond, this gift from one another, which happened in any, let's say, at all, let's say the whole earth, whenever you have two who come together, you have a marriage. So God is going to elevate this in the Christian life precisely at the level of a sacrament. He is going to sanctify the marriage, which makes that between two Catholics, you don't have a natural marriage, that is a marriage which is only at the natural level. This is the natural fundament, but immediately God is elevating it at his level. He's pouring into the marriage an incredible holiness. And this holiness, if you look at other sacraments, you have some which have a kind of transitory grace. For example, the confession, you go to confession, the priests say, I absolve you, so I forgive you, then it's done. It's a, it's a grace that just passes through, washes you, and done. But you have other sacraments, we have a permanent effect. And marriage belongs to them. It's a little bit different from others, uh, three of them, which give the character, which have a permanent, permanent effect, but for all eternity. Marriage, is only during life. It's a different between both, while both are alive, you have this marriage, which, let's say, is the only, uh, let's say, break, we may say so, possible, it is death. When we speak of annulment, it is uh, most of the time an abuse of language. The church, hear well, the church cannot break a consummated marriage. It's above its power. If it is a real marriage, the tribunal can only see or look if this was a marriage from the start or not. So if the necessary conditions at the start were there, the church cannot annul. It is never an annulment in the fact that it would be an act of breaking. 
The Christian marriage cannot. It is a false concept that people may have, thinking that the church could, so say, erase it. Not working. I remember a missionary telling us the story of two African coming to to the priest and saying, "Oh, marriage is not is not working. So we come to for you to do something to annul it." And the priest said, "No, I can't." So they came back after six months. He said, it's really not working. Then finally, the priest took. Uh, you say a goupillon. How do you say that? A goupillon. Um, uh, goupillon. Uh, a spurge. A spurge. And so he started with the man. Bang! Then with the wife. Bang! Oh. And he continued this way, and the others said, Well, well, stop! And the priest said, That's the only way I can break the marriage. No, we have to understand. It's, I think we do not emphasize enough at which height husband and wife, the Catholic husband and wife, find themselves when we say Catholic family. This is, as I said, a permanent. That means that it's not just at the time of the marriage, at the ceremony of marriage, that you have something sacred? No. This is a start. It is like a fountain, a spring of grace. The family is a sanctuary. And it will last as long as the marriage will last. It's very important that you understand that. And why so? Because that's the place where God wants his children to come to existence. His children to be formed, educated as children of God. Not just as children of this world. And for that he's going to entrust his children to the father and mother. You don't only receive from God a nice little child. You receive a child of God. And you have this duty to bring this heart, this reason, to the knowledge of the faith, to the love of God. You have to prepare them for heaven. It is very, very high, but we, we need to, I say, to emphasize this because, yes, this bond of marriage elevated at this level, of course, will first, has as a first effect on husband and wife, of course, but also on the children. They will benefit, let's say, the family which is the result of the marriage, is in that state of holiness. And this is independent of, we could say, human misery. We can still have our defects, our ups and downs and so on in the family. There will be, it belongs, I may say, to the poor misery of human life. But nevertheless, nevertheless, you have this constant intervention of God which is elevating this family at that level. If you understand that, you may also understand that those who want to prevent the children, well, human beings, to go to God, they will they will attack the Catholic family. It is very interesting to see and to hear Lenin say 
that we must destroy up to the idea, the concept of father, of fatherhood, so that the human can no longer go to God. God is father. So let's destroy the idea of father so that the people no longer know how and where to go. It's interesting, isn't it? It's, it's really diabolical. It is, deeply. And I may say, what we have to experience nowadays is, is an in incredible, incredible attack on the family. Let's say, not just on this level of the holiness of the Catholic family, but on the ground, which is the natural level. So they try to dis demolish everything, not just the holiness, but even, let's say, the natural elements of, of the marriage. And this makes that we all are aware of this incredible, incredible crisis, which is attacking both this society of the church and the human society. It can be, it can be easily, let's say, overwhelming. And maybe, maybe discouraging. And that's why I think we need to keep the correct perspective <coughs> on the whole thing. And this perspective is that there is a God. You know, when Saint Michael was in fight with Lucifer and the rebellious angels, he needed only to say one, one word, who is like God. This, just this word, God, is the answer. And it's much, much deeper than what you think. There is a God. Well, God is. He's the creator. He's not only the creator, he's the governor. What does it mean? It means that there is not one being which escapes him, his control. That means that whatever happens on earth remains under the control of God. If there's something evil happening, this cannot happen if God does not give the okay. And when God gives the okay, he gives the limit to this evil. And the evil, maybe most of the time the devil or evil people, they cannot go overboard over this limit given by God. We are stricken. We wonder why does God allow all these things to happen? It is true. It is true. We, we don't have all the answers. We know that God allows trials. Fundamentally, it comes from the fact that he created us with a freedom. So he wanted us to freely agree with his plan. The plan to make all of us his children and to give us eternal happiness. As he created us free, he wants from us a free yes. And that's why, that's why there was a test. There was a test for the angels, there is a test for us human beings, and to start with Adam and Eve. And unfortunately, our dear first parents missed it. And with this 
the incredible fortune which was in their hands was lost. And we, well, we inherit, instead of a fortune, a terrible debt, which we call original sin. Part of it is that heaven is closed. Gates of heaven are closed. With the first sin, there's no way we can repair. The offense against God is so, is so enormous. But God, by mercy, allows us to understand somehow the seriousness of the offense against God by certain consequences which are at our level. To lose heaven is not at our level. We grasp something, we don't grasp the depths of it. But death is at our level. Do you realize that we all die because of that first sin? That's a part of the heritage. We all die because Adam and Eve had this crazy idea of eat, eat that fruit. And the sufferings, the pains. Before that sin, there was absolutely no pain, no suffering on earth. It's all consequence of sin. God allows that because of sin. But God, who is infinitely just, who has to punish the offense against his infinite, infinite majesty, is so mighty that he will use precisely this sufferings. He will turn them into a greater good. And by this, make out of it a mean of salvation. The hardest, the greatest act where we see this contrast, this incredible contrast between evil and God is going to turn it into good is the day seed that is killing God, which is the death of our Lord. There is no, there is nothing higher in evil than to try to kill God. And, well, killing our Lord, they so to say, kill God, not in his divine nature, but is in human nature, yes, they did. There is nothing more serious than that. In the whole history of mankind, there is nothing worse than that. And God is going to take that and to turn it into the act by which our Lord is going to save us, to redeem us, to pay at our place. In such a way that whenever we have anything to suffer, a pain of any sort, physical, psychological, of the soul, of the body, whatever. As far as we unite it with the passion of our Lord, these pains turn into remedy. Remedy against sin. Remedy of salvation. You may wonder, so what has this to do with Mary, spouse and mother? Well, God, as I said, is in absolute control. 
we have to maintain that and it's very important, especially today uh, when you see all these new laws which are against Christianity, against God, against the family. You have the impression to see, so we have no means to fight it. We have the impression to be just under a tsunami and let's say, yes, that's the human perspective which is falling under our senses, under our understanding. And as I said, that could discourage us. And we do not have the right to be discouraged. Why? Because, once again, there is a God. And if God, and when God, wants this to stop, he just need to do even less than that. When he wants it to stop, it's going to stop. He's really absolute in his majesty, in his power on us. We cannot have one thought. We cannot move one finger if God is not there to give us that strength. So if and when he wants this trial to stop, he can. <coughs> what does it mean? It means also something. That is, he, first for the time being, he wants us to be in that trial. But never does this mean that he wants us to fall? Never. God allows a trial, but he wants us to win. He wants this trial, trial to drive us higher. That is why it is a point of our faith that whenever we are in trial, we are offered the proportionate grace and help needed to win. Never does God allow a trial to hit us without providing us the necessary mean to win, to overcome it. And these we forget. And these the devil wants us to forget. Sometimes, and many times, we have a hard time with that because the way of winning of God is not ours. When we say win, we want a triumph. And to understand that God is winning through the cross, through his death on the cross, it's, it's hard. We need the faith for that. We need it. Let's go a little bit further. Our Lord himself took the care to tell us everything cooperates to the good for those who love God. Everything. Everything means there are no exceptions. St. Augustine will even dare to say everything, even sin. Even that terrible fall of fanning God will cooperate for the good for those who love God. In that sense, that falling, we want to immediately, as soon as possible, stand up. Get away from it. Make penance. Take the means to get away from that sin. And this way we make progress into fighting our defects, overcoming them and growing into, into the virtue. And so, what is marriage? What has marriage to do with this? Well, we just said, we see that marriage is under 
incredible attack. Family at all levels, the children, the fidelity in the marriage, uh, incredible things now against, against the human nature. They call it with an incredible name. There are no, how do you say, no vocals. Start with an L and they continue to add things. Now they have put a plus after this LGBT, God knows how far they want to go, so they don't even know themselves, that's why they put a plus. It's really vomiting from hell. God provides you the means against this in the sacrament of marriage. Where do we have to find the strength? First, there. And remember that the sacraments are channels. They bring you the grace like, like a channel. So, where is the source? The source of all sacraments is the holy sacrifice of the Mass. That's where our Lord merited all the graces, all the graces which we need, which are put at our disposal precisely in the sacraments. And that's true also of marriage. So the first, the first, how do you say, pump, if you want, of this grace which you have in marriage is the sacrifice of the Mass. I cannot give you a better advice that the whole family go to Mass. I know the Mass is also under attack, so you don't have it everywhere. You don't have it, let's say, every day. But we see that. We see there where a husband, where a wife, where both go as soon as possible, as often as possible. Every day, if possible. The bond of marriage receives an incredible strength. It, to say, wipes out the the obstacles. It gives the blessing on the family. And yes, it is true. Today the Holy Mass is under attack. And I may say most probably that's why the Blessed Virgin Mary is procuring another mean, which is the Rosary. The Popes, one after the other, they invite to pray the rosary, but especially to pray the rosary in the family. To gather wife, husband, children, all together to pray this prayer of the rosary. They insist and say, even if you are tired, Stay faithful to that prayer. Do it. We may add, and that's very interesting, let's say we may, I would like to introduce here Fatima. It's not direct, it's indirect, but you have certain phrases from Sister Lucy which are very interesting on the family. First, Note this very interesting. During the miracle of the Son, as the Blessed Virgin Mary had announced, she was there. So she appeared in the sky, in, the, in heaven. And she was with the child Jesus and with Saint Joseph. There were the three there. You have the Holy Family present there during this miracle of the Son. It is not just a good luck. It has a profound signification. And you may find it 
in the letter of Sister Lucy to Cardinal Carafa. Cardinal Carafa wrote to Sister Lucy at, more or less at the moment when he was entrusted by Pope John Paul II to, to found, to establish an institute for the family. And at that occasion he wrote to Sister Lucy. And Sister Lucy wrote him back. And even Cardinal Carafa said that he was surprised to receive an answer. And it's this answer, Sister Lucy said, that the final battle will be around the family. <coughs> so, if you hear that, you see what's happening today. And you make this link with Fatima, where you see the Holy Family there. The Blessed Virgin Mary, during the whole apparition of Fatima, she's alone. She appears alone to the children. She is prepared by the angel before, but in all, let's say, the, the apparition of the 13th, she's alone. But for that time, for the miracle, she's with the child Jesus and with Saint Joseph. I would say that what I've told you till now is like an introduction. We go now into what is the core. If you look the way God did repair the damage caused by sin, original sin and all the other sins, as I told you, man made it such a way that they broke everything, they broke all the bridges, impossible to be saved, impossible to go to heaven. It would have been pure justice for God to say, get lost. I have enough of you. That's the way you treat me, fine. It would have been just. But God is not like that, we know it. And God used and say this poor misery of man to show even more to us how much he loves us to an incredible dimension which is above any understanding any understanding what does he do? he will ask his son to repair and to repair that means to take our punishment I may be a little bit too long, but if you have a mosquito who is attacking you, what do you do? You do an incredible quick trial. You see that your majesty has been hurt by that unjust aggressor. And the death sentence comes very quickly. You deliver your sentence to the secular arm and you expect the sentence to be executed as quickly as possible. And if you get that mosquito, you're happy. <laughs> because justice is done. If you miss it, hmm, you try to get it. Now let's, let's say that we are less than a mosquito to God. And what does God do? Instead of hitting the mosquito, he gave the blow to his son. He asked his son to get that blow up to death. God, in his humanity, dies at our place. That's how far it goes. But our Lord, he's going to use this incarnation as the mean to salvation. Not only he will save us, he will elevate us at his level. He will communicate his life. He will transform his human nature into the instrument 
of sanctification. All the graces we receive and we need to go to heaven, we receive it thanks and in the most precious humanity of our Lord. And incarnation, that means God did assume a human nature. <coughs> but he wanted to be, so to say, to put it into human history. So he wanted, with his human nature, to follow the normal development of a human being. So he wanted to have a human mother. This, you have to understand, means that definitely Mary is the mother of Jesus. She gives to Jesus his human nature. But at the same time, she is not just the mother of a human being. The person, the person who is assuming this human nature is not a human person. This person is God. That's why we must say she's the mother of God. A mother does not give life to a human nature. She gave life to a John, a Peter, a Agnes, a, a person. So does the Blessed Virgin Mary. And we have a council, well, several councils who use that beautiful image. They say, Jesus, well, the Son of God, who is born from a father without mother in all eternity, is born in time from a mother without father. It is a beautiful expression. That means that the Blessed Virgin, ever Virgin and Mother, will be vested with incredible privileges. We understand that if God wants a human being to be his mother, he will make her worthy of himself. That's why St. Thomas will dare to say that Mary is reaching to the borders of the infinite. In other words, you cannot go higher. Take the greatest of all the angels. I may say it's nothing in comparison with the beauty, with the grace you find in the Blessed Virgin and Mother Mary. Authors will dare to say, and they are right, take all the saints and all the angels together, put all this holiness which you find in them. No, the Blessed Virgin Mary has more. There is more holiness in the Blessed Virgin Mary than in all the angels and all the other saints together. Difficult to grasp all this, but easy to understand that God, who is almighty, can do that. And he went, I may say, to the highest it could go, to the Blessed Virgin Mary making her his mother, that one thing. He wanted his life to develop like, as I said, a human life, and a human starts his life in a family. So Jesus wanted a family. So even if he does not have a human father, he wanted to have a father. And that's Saint Joseph. So the Blessed Virgin Mary is indeed, really, she is a spouse. The spouse of Saint Joseph, absolutely. We see in the, in the Gospel, 
especially let's say the gospel of the childhood can take St. Matthew, St. Luke, that's the both who speak uh, about this, you will see this expression which is very delicious, uh, where even when the Blessed Virgin Mary s speaks, she says, for example, at the, when the recovery of uh, Jesus in the temple, your father and, and me, we were desperate, uh, we were in old sorrows looking for you, why did you do that to us? your father and me. And St. Matthew will say, the father and mother, and his mother. St. Joseph and the mother. And uh, at the same time, you will see the angel talk to St. Joseph and say, uh, take the child and his mother. Take the child and his mother. So St. Joseph, the angel speaks to Saint Joseph. He doesn't speak to the Blessed Virgin Mary. He said to Saint Joseph, take the child and his mother. He does not say and your wife, but she of course she is the wife. But he says, his mother. Now Jesus will have a lot of how do we say he's going to cause our our salvation a different level, at the level of effectiveness. He's the one who is making it. At the level of the form, he's communicating to us his life. At the level of the end, he's our end, he's our aim. At the level of the exemplarity, He's giving us an example. He's showing us the way. What do you have to do to go to heaven? Just look. Look and follow. And what you see in Jesus, as I, I told you before, Jesus is making of his human nature the instrument of sanctification. This, the grace is a participation to God's Life. But this life of God, which God wants to, God to, to, go, to give to us, and which only He can produce in our soul, only God can do that, will nevertheless use a human instrument. And the privileged instrument He's using is His human nature. And all the other instruments of sanctification, which will be like the priest, like the sacraments, they are just extension. They are, they are producing as an instrument in the hand of this human nature of our Lord. And I may say, above or just below the human nature of our Lord, and above all the sacraments, you find the Blessed Virgin Mary. God wanted this holiness, this work of sanctification to depend on his mother. It's the famous fiat of the Blessed Virgin Mary. The angel is exposing to the future mother of God his plan the plan of, sal of salvation, it will depend on the yes of Mary. If Mary would have said no, nothing would have happened. God would have respected this freedom. But, well, you know that God hmm, uh, got a yes, fiat, fiat miki. That's what we say at every Angelus, the angel of the Lord, we remember that. And that means that he uses the Blessed Virgin Mary as the, the passage, I may say, this obligatory passage of all the sanctification. All of us, all those who go to heaven, all the saints, owe it to this yes 
of the Blessed Virgin Mary. You may understand in this way that she is not just the mother of Jesus. Being the mother of Jesus, she becomes our mother. We receive the life. The only Redeemer is our Lord. Nevertheless, the Lord wanted to come to us through his mother. And he is going to give to her, he's going to associate her to this work of redemption, to an incredible level. So that what we just said from Jesus, of his human nature, like for example, that he's, it is this human nature which is really effectively going to give us the grace. Well, he will use his mother. We said that the form, that is, God wants to, Jesus wants to give us his life. We have these words of St. Paul, he says, I live. No, it's no longer me. It's Jesus who lives in me. And in reality, you want to know what is holiness? Holiness is to allow Jesus to live more and more in us. To take over more and more of our life. That's holiness. And Jesus starts that at baptism. And he wants to have more and more influence. That's why he sends us the Holy Ghost. But all this happens thanks and through the blessed Virgin Mother Mary. And let's say it could be another conference. It could be the one which is corresponding to the title, the exemplar, the example. We know that everything that Jesus did in his life did merit for us, was an example for us, and it merit for us the grace we need to follow this example. And this we can and we must say of the Blessed Virgin Mary. God has put so much love in the Blessed Virgin Mary that not alone, but always in and with and following her son, she was to give the most beautiful example as a spouse, as a mother. And she did marry for her children the graces we need to follow this example. That's why I cannot insist en enough in telling you really bring into your marriage the Blessed Virgin Mary in her role as spouse, as mother. That you do precisely praying the rosary every, every day possibly but consecrating your marriage, your family, to the heart of Mary, to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. Bring her in, get close to her. She is given to us as the protector, as a defender. And I may say, Fatima is one of these incredible, very, very mighty and strong signals of heaven. God knows what is going to happen to us. And we say we are right in it, in this incredible trial. But he gives us, before it happens, the Blessed Virgin Mary. And he gives us to understand her power. The Blessed Virgin Mary says in Fatima that the peace of nations has been put in her hands. You want peace in earth? Don't go with treaty, peace treaties and so on. Go to the Blessed Virgin Mary. It's much more efficacious. You want to know the date of the end of World War II? In Germany, it is the 8th of May, which, by the way, is the feast of St. Michael, patron of Germany. 
and also the 8th of May is the feast of the Mary Mediatrix of all graces and several other feasts of the Blessed Virgin Mary. The definitive end of World War II with Japan and so on is the 15th of August. You all know what feast it is and you understand that it's not the Freemasons who choose that date because of that. It's God. God who writes correctly on these odd lines of man. We must trust God much, much more. We are in a hard time. We don't have in hands the results. But we have in our hands, God wants it, that we have to do our duty, duty of state, every day. God wants that from us, not more, not less. And he will provide. And we may say, today is more than ever through his mother, the Blessed Virgin Mary. Thank you.